perspectives between Ireland and the United States. Please welcome Andrew Lowe. Good morning. All right, well, um, it looks like I'm first up and, and here to get everybody fired up for liberty today. So uh, it's really a, a blessing for me to be here. I'm from a little town back home in the north of Ireland called Ballyclare. And it's truly God's grace that I'm over here now and able to speak to, to a wonderful crowd like this with, about my, my learnings of, of liberty and, and the American ideals. Uh, so I just want to first of all give you a little information about what it was like for me growing up in Northern Ireland. We have a population there now of about 1.8 million approximately. So it's really a, a small country. We call it the we country. And uh, I'm from sort of the Ulster Scots heritage, which I know had a prominent, important role in the founding of this country. And as I've been here and read and learn more about it, it really has been inspirational for me. And, and so I just want to share some more about that a little later. Uh, my growing up, I actually was a, a child of a policeman. So I grew up in a policing family in, in Belfast. And... 70s and 80s, that was a, quite a dangerous family uh, to be living in. And we, for example, my father would always have us wait while we returned to our car. He would always check underneath if there was... ...tell you a little bit about a, an incident where... There, uh, uh, ...so folks had planted a bomb in... Uh, in the home of a policeman with his family there, and, and they called in the report to, to notify everyone that this bomb had been planted, as they did. And so this, this scramble of emergency responders to get to this home, to this gentleman, to try and save his wife and kids, emergency services headed there. My father was also in the response team, and what they would do is set up what they call an incident control point, where they would basically control the, the firefighters, the police, the bomb disposal from this point. Um, what they didn't realize was that the same people who had planted this bomb had realized that they could predict where this incident control point would be. And so my father just happened to be about 20 feet from a secondary explosive device that had been planted right there. And so he was talking to a superior officer an explosion went off behind him, and all around him started raining little white pellets. And what it was are little fertilizer pellets, which were used to uh, to make the bomb. And the, the detonator had gone off. It failed to detonate the full bomb. Instead, it, it blew the material over my father and his, his colleagues. And he returned to the barracks that night, took off his hat, and he said the his hat was just covered in white powder. And yeah, he thanked God for preserving him. And, uh, and so I'm thankful that I'm able to be here and, and talking to you today. Um, so, <clears throat> so then the, uh, there's another, another part of that that I want to share that I feel is interesting since I've learned more here about liberty and whatnot. There's a, po a political party back home called Sinn Féin, and, and they are actively seeking to unite Ireland as, a, as one nation, a 32 county. Uh, on their website, you can go there and check it out. They're advocating for a 32 county socialist republic. And now that I'm here in America, my, my learnings and the ideals of liberty that I've learned, how they now supersede any of my, my origins back home about one side or the other because really the ideas of liberty are so much greater than any of the, the troubles back home. It's so much more important and I feel so much more beneficial for both sides of that divide and maybe one day I can, I can go back there and So I also then just want to tell you a little about my, my schooling as I grew up in a nice uh, government school in, in Bally Clare. Great history teacher. I loved history. And 
Paul McCauley, still remember him. And remember the day when we were learning about the history of, of Ireland and Britain and the greatest achievement in the history of Britain, we were taught, was the foundation of the National Health Service. And I was uh, trying to be a good student. Oh, I'll take that down. Right, okay. And I still remember that to this day because we, there's no teachings, no concept of this principle of liberty like we have here. Talk a little bit more, uh, more about that. So, as I then went through, I actually became a teacher, and uh, in a in a school in Belfast, an inner city school, and really a, a very interesting experience. I want to tell you a story about one of the the, the guys I taught. He was about 17 years old. I'll call him Brian in this story. And so, it, took, it was a hard school. It took a few months for the kids to warm up and and came to me one day after class and said, Sir, i got to tell you, you know what's going on, because he was struggling getting some papers done and whatnot. Sir, I have a, an 18-month-old son, and uh, so I, I'm trying my best. I, I'm working part-time jobs to try and pay a little bit of the, the child support to the child's mother. He says, Sir, I, I met her at a party. One thing led to another. I wasn't really that interested, but this, uh, this child came along and the situation was such that he, he had to have a paternity test. And so he had, he told me, of, of he had this vision. He was in the doctor's room waiting for these results, and he had a vision. The doctor would come out and say, Brian, it's okay, son. It's not yours. As the door swung open, the doctor says, Brian, it's yours. <laughs> and I only tell you that because what he then told me was, you know, the little girls here in, in, in Belfast, the babies to them are worth their weight in gold because when they have a baby, a new husband, they go straight to the top of the housing provider list. So it's a, it's a recognized way for young girls back home to get social housing is to, to have a child when they're young out of wedlock. And, uh, you know, that's unfortunately what we're, uh, we're going to be facing here in the United States also. And uh, so I came to America 2000 and originally 2004, and thinking Americans were crazy. I'd been educated that way, you know. Americans are crazy with their guns and and uh, and no health care, uh, and you know, kind of supportive of of President Obama. I thought, you know, don't hold that against me. Uh, and and so. What, the irony of it was, I had a job and had health care, then they passed Obamacare and I lost my health care, uh, which is amazing, right? Uh, and I'm thankful now I'm actually with an organization called Christian Healthcare Ministries. I don't know if you know I'm out every month and it's a cost sharing program. I don't, I'm, so I've opted out, which is great. And you know what, there was something here in America that I, I couldn't put my finger on. Here, here I was in, a, in this foreign land, and there was something here that just attracted me. And I had come back and forth between home and here, and it really took me years to identify it, but I feel now I know it, and it's the, it's the absolute heart knowledge that people in this country have of liberty. And it's a very powerful, subtle thing that it's difficult to convey because this country right now is not as, as everyone here would like to see it run. But there's this knowledge in our hearts of what liberty is, godly liberty and biblical liberty. And it's really been just wonderful to me for me to learn about it. And some of the some of the people that helped me with that, there's a gentleman up in the Bay Area named Mike Winther. He has an organization called the Institute for Principal Studies. He teaches a class called Biblical Principles of Government. Ten week class I sat through. Wonderful, wonderful education. And, uh, I also had a visit a couple of weeks ago here from a missionary who works in Africa, in South Africa. He told an interesting story that I think applies to America. He said. In Africa, they have a problem because the, the locals there, they worship basically their, their dead ancestors. 
and there's the, the spiritual blindness that they have means that they can't learn. You can't teach them logic and reason because they're so preoccupied with the spiritual blindness. And he said the only way that we can, uh, that we can battle the spiritual blindness is, is with God's blessing. And that leads me into really what we need to do. And uh, first of all is prayer. You know, we really have to pray that the Lord will open the eyes of the blinded, that he would allow the message of his truth and, and, uh, and liberty to, to come into the hearts of the people that are, uh, that are in this country. I believe if we, we pray hard that that, of course, will happen. Uh, we also need to speak out too often, and I've noticed it because when coming here I've had a bit of an outside view on things, and we're just beaten over the head so often by the, by the forces out there. They try and make us feel that we're an extremist minority or we're, we're on the margins, and so we need to keep our mouths shut, otherwise we're, uh, we're going to be ostracized and people think we're crazy. It's a plan that they have put in place to make us feel that way. We must speak out because we have on our side the, the biblical truth and the, the biblical founding of this country. We have to challenge them and meet them head on. And it's really a, a spiritual fight. And so I encourage everyone to, to mentor people. You know, we, we can meet folks out there that maybe don't have the knowledge you do. The people in this room, I'm sure, have lots of, of knowledge and information can make a difference. Mentor people. Share the knowledge. Educate them. Wake up the churches. We have so many silent pulpits in this country about really the biblical principles of government. They refuse to, to speak out on how civil government should be run and based upon information, that the truth that's in the Bible. We need to see more from the pulpit. So speak to your pastors. I just want to finish with a uh, little story that I, I read in a book here called The Bulletproof George Washington. And uh, some of you may have heard of this. This is, a, this is a, a chief who wanted to meet with Washington. He, he waited 15 years to, to meet Washington after a battle that they had both been involved in. And this is what he, he said at a, at a campfire meeting that he insisted was set up. I'm a I am a chief and ruler over my tribes. My influence extends to the waters of the Great Lakes and to the far blue mountains. I have traveled a long and weary path that I might see the young warrior of the great battle. It was on the day when the white man's blood mixed with the streams of our forest that I beheld this chief indicating Washington. I called to my young man and said, Mark yon tall and daring warrior. He is not of the red coat tribe. He hath an Indian's wisdom and his warriors fight as we do. Himself is alone exposed. Quick, let your aim be certain, and he dies. Our rifles were leveled, rifles which but for you knew not how to miss. T'was all in vain. A power mightier far than we shielded you. Seeing that you were under the special guardianship of the great spirit, we immediately ceased to fire at you. I am, an old, and, I am old and soon shall be gathered to the great council fire of my fathers in the land of shades. But ere I go, there is something big bids me to speak in the voice of prophecy. Listen, the great spirit protect, protects that man, indicating Washington, and guides his destinies. He will become the chief of nations, and a people yet unborn will heal him as the founder of a mighty empire. I am come to pay homage to the man who is the particular favorite of heaven and who can never die in battle. And... <clears throat> So nowadays, an Indian chief in our society, the, the, he would be hailed as wise, and, and even back then they recognized Almighty God's hand protecting uh, George Washington. And so I just want to encourage us all to return to that, that faith that God can communicate with even the unbeliever and ask for his guidance and... and for this country and thank you.
<clears throat> we want to welcome you to uh, Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa. My uh, three children attended school here and graduated from uh, Calvary Chapel High School, so it's really, ple really a pleasure to be here with you today at this location. Um, Forty years ago, I was in this uh, sanctuary and 19. So I'm old now. Like two or three of you, and <clears throat> we sang a song uh, that still resonates with me today, uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In this room, it was just glorious just to sing that song, uh, Matthew 6:33, and it's the verse that carries me every day. I want to give a few thank yous. I want to thank uh, Bonnie O'Neill for opening our presentation today. And doing all the organization. I want to thank uh, Pastor Chaz Saleya for doing our opening prayer and our pledge. And I also want to announce that, S, as, as Bonnie did, that SHR Media is here today, shrmedia.com. So if you want to text your friends and relatives, uh, it's streaming live. Uh, so you can say, hey, na na na, this is where we are. Why aren't you here? But if you can't be here, why don't you go ahead and watch it on your laptop? So with that, <clears throat> Dr. David Lehman is in the building, I've been told. Um, oh, why don't you go ahead and set up your Dr. Lehman? And uh, <clears throat> he is now the new chairman of the Orange County Eagle Forum. Is uh, Jeannie Gooden, Jeanine Gooden here today? Jeannie, would you please stand, Jeannie? I want to thank you for your years of service to the Eagle Forum, and I want to thank your husband as well, Dr. Gooden, for all of his support. <laughs> Dr. Lehman, you're filling some awfully big shoes. Yes. I'll talk slowly until you're set up. I'm already. You're ready. Dr. Lehman loves to talk on a myriad of subjects, from the humorous to the very serious. And he will now be speaking on a very serious topic of Islam. Welcome, Dr. Lehman. Speak on Islam in 15 minutes is kind of like trying to write the Encyclopedia Britannica on one side of a poppy seed with a grease marker. But I'm going to try. I'm a slow learner, but I forget quick. There we are. You have to look through me. Okay. Okay, I'd like to share a little bit about Islam. And um, just, just the idea of what you can do with... I have a friend up in Victorville, and the Bible says to speak to them of reputation in private. And so he takes the councilman, the city, the, uh, city officials, and various other people, and he asks, can I have an hour of your time? And he brings another person with him, and these guys are loaded for bear. I mean, they've read every John Birch Society magazine in the last 17 years. They know everything. And so they ask, can we have an hour of your time? And they say, sure. He said the, the shortest one was two and a half hours, and some of them were four hours. It's very difficult to approach them when they're surrounded by their peers, but if you can get them alone, and you know what you're talking about, and I'm sure most of you do, go for it. Well, I had opportunities to uh, be with a group here, Ministry to Muslims, and we'd go around and do debates with Muslims. Now, I debate atheists every month. Uh, two months ago, I had a debate with a former Muslim turned atheist lesbian on homosexuality. Um, anyway, uh, the, I think it really helps to know what the people are thinking. And I learn from these people every time. I, I told Richard Carrier, who's a world-renowned atheist, after the debate, I said, I do a much better debate, a much better job preparing for the debate after the debate. And he said, he kind of laughed and said, so do I. Well, oh, Islam gets results. They have obedient women, uh, impressive technical skills, um, moral clarity, God bless Hitler, Respectful children, you can see it in chains. 
And in 2007, Islam and Judaism's holiest days overlapped for 10 days. Muslims racked up 397 dead bodies and 94 terror attacks across 10 countries during this time while the Jews worked on their 159th Nobel Prize. And I just went through and looked at the Nobel Prize winners, and you interesting to see the difference, the Jewish versus the Muslim. And of course, the Peace Prize, Arafat got one of those. I don't think you can count some of those Peace Prizes. Anyway, this, this, and want a piece of, you know, a little bit of piece of everything. Anyway, um, so this is kind of a little bit of an idea. Um, and one of the fellows that I debate, or we, we had uh, seven debates in England, and the last guy, the, probably the best debater, was Shabir Ali, and he told me after the last debate, he said, we Muslims lost all seven debates. I said, I didn't believe that you guys admitted something like that, even if it was true. I said, well, that's interesting. Let's see, Mohammed, he didn't walk on water, he didn't feed 5,000 people, he didn't heal anybody, he didn't raise anybody from the dead, didn't raise himself from the dead, and so they were scrounging around, at least not in the Quran. So they were looking around for a miracle they could give to him, and the only thing they could come up with was the Quran itself, because he was supposedly illiterate. So I said, well, what does the Quran teach? Well, it teaches, and of course, to understand what the Quran teaches, you have to look at the, 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 the Hadith, Ibn Ishaq, Ali Muslim, al-Bakari, Tabari, and all the others, and you kind of piece it together. And so basically, this is what it teaches. There are seven earths, flat like a carpet, separated by 500 years. That's walking years, sit on, sitting on top of this large fish called a noon, which is on top of a bull, which is on top of a cube, which is on top of dust, and only all of what's under the dust. And above the seventh earth are eight giant goats with 500 years between their front hooves and their back hooves. Shooting stars are missiles God throws at demons to keep them out of heaven. The sun sets at a murky pool surrounded by a bunch of people. So what did Muhammad get right in the area of cosmology and cosmogony? Absolutely nothing. So when we go through the human hygiene and they ask him, is it okay to drink from the, or to use the pool of Buddha for our ablutions? And Satan dwells in your nose at night. You sniff the water up your nose, out your mouth three times, all over your face and hands, and it had dead animals, human excrement, and uh, <clears throat> various other things in it. And Muhammad said nothing can pollute the water. So basically, this is what we're talking about. Um, go through a little bit of detail on this. In fact, in human reproduction, you put it all together, we have Muhammad's view of human reproduction. Semen forms between the backbone and the ribs, wrong. Then it joins with the female semen, wrong. And whichever one is discharged first determines which parent the child will resemble, wrong. The child spends 40 days as a drop of sperm, wrong. Then the child spends another 40 days as a clot of blood, wrong. Then the child becomes a lump, wrong. Then the child becomes bones, wrong. Then the bones are wrapped with flesh, wrong. After the final shape is determined, God just finally decides whether the child will be male or female. So here again, we find that Muhammad was wrong on almost everything. And yet we've got 1.7 billion people following the hallucinations of one man, and the only support they can give is the scientific reliability of the Quran. That's it. That's their argument. So, and of course, document all this, but we don't have time. There are three stages of jihad, and this is probably what's so difficult for most people to understand. Um, there is a weakened stage. This is when they live in the country like Muhammad did when he was in Mecca. And of course, he was surrounded by people from the Koresh tribe, which didn't really like him. They, they thought that what he was teaching was not being supportive of their different idols. And so they tried to make bargains with him and various other things. Well, this weakened, so he would be sort of not really aggressive at that point. There is no compulsion in religion, speaking of living quietly with unbelievers. And people say, these Muslim my friends of mine, they're the nicest people you would ever want to meet. That's true. But a true Muslim is not going to stay that way forever. In fact, they get to the preparation stage, and if they are really Muslims, when the Muslims are reasonably influential, still a minority, because of their future goal is direct confrontation with the enemy, that's us, they make preparations in every possible area, financial, physical, military, mental, and others. Sir 859, let not the unbelievers think that they can get better of the godly, that's them, that they never frustrate them against them. Make ready your strength to the utmost of your power, including steeds of war, that would be tanks, to strike terror into the hearts of the enemies. And then there's the jihad stage. This is where it gets a little scary. This is the stage where the Muslims, although they still may be a minority, have strength and power. And at this stage, the Muslims' duty and activity is to fight the enemy, overturning the system of non-Muslim country and establishing an Islamic authority. Stanley, Stanley Sharia law. Fight and slay the pagans wherever you find them, seize them, believe them, 
and lie in wait for them in every stratagem of war, Muslims are commanded to kill anyone who chooses not to convert to Islam. The verse says, wherever you find them, there's no place to hide. Some countries that try to give refuge for Muslims are in trouble because the Muslims don't want to give refuge to anyone that leaves Islam. Beirut, Lebanon was the paradise of the Middle East. It was beautiful. Uh, you see a lot of people who have been there during that time, and they were living peacefully with Muslims. There's about a 50-some percent Christian group, and the Muslims were down to about 35, 40 percent, and they kept getting larger in number. Uh, the average Muslim can have up to eight children per family. And in one city, just not too far from Cairo, this person that I know who just came from there said their average woman will bear up to 20 children. They start them when they're young and they go till they can't bear children anymore. And this is to make warriors for Muhammad or for whoever happens to be in power. So they, <clears throat> lying and deceit is also part of their mindset. Muhammad's use of mosques. Mosque is not a church like we think of. Mosque is basically, it's everything. It's a parliament, it's a house of war. It's a place where Muhammad used to, to plan war strategy, hold court, receive tribal leaders. And so, you know, they've, they've uncovered mosques in New York and New Jersey, and they're just loaded with weapons, because that's what they do. Justification for killing women and children. And of course, when you're speaking of women, I have a Taliban singles online dating service. Uh, I would like to own a woman, camel, or goat. I'm wishing, I'm winking at you. Name, uh, I can't pronounce it. Age 35, location, K, occupation not allowed, income not allowed, hobbies not allowed. Anyway. And of course, you know, you have them in the, the burqas. And of course, this is not just so that they can't, you can't see their face. It's also to, at least at that time, to hide who Muhammad was having coming to and fro from his places of abode. And there were some rumors going around, so basically it's pretty hard to tell who that is. The problem with this is it weighs almost as much as a bowling ball in some cases. You can't see more than about two feet ahead of you, and there's no peripheral vision, and some of them get run over because they, don't, they can't see what's coming. And it's very difficult to run because it goes all the way down to the ground, so you trip over it. So, um, and of course, we're misinformed by the media. A Muslim man can be married up to four times at the same time, uh, women can't have uh, multiple husbands. Men are, have the right to ask for a divorce, but women can't. Women have only inherit half of what men do. A woman is not allowed to answer the door of her home if the husband is not there. Even if her brothers or relatives at the door, women should stay in their houses. Wife refuses to have sexual relationship with her husband. It's permissible for her husband to physically beat her until she submits. And according to Sharia law, the first, third time that happens, he's allowed to cut her head off. So. And the goal of Islam is world conquest. Mariana Abdu Allah Madudi, one of Islam's most well-known scholars, writes, Islam is not a normal religion like other religions in the world. And Muslim nations are not like normal nations. And Muslim nations are very special because they have a command from Allah to rule the entire world and to be over every nation in the world. Christians are the target of that goal because Christians are likely to convert. So there is no law but God's law. In other words, all man-made laws are inferior to Sharia law, therefore they don't have to obey it. And here is one thing, why are the brutal murders, why are those murders so brutal? And I'll give you some examples, they're pretty scary. I, I hate to do it right after breakfast, but I think you need to see what actually is happening. And Surah 914 talks about somebody, fight them and Allah will punish them by your hands, cover them with shame, help you to victory over them, heal the breasts of believers, and still the indignation of their hearts. That's the believers' hearts. In other words, they're so filled with hatred that by violently killing somebody, it helps them to, to uh, relieve that tension. It makes them feel better. So the more brutal you kill somebody, of course, it also instills fear in the hearts of everyone else when they see what you're doing. In fact, they will... Um, you know, you might get a, 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 a head for your birthday or, you know. Versus showing that Muhammad is merciful. Okay, a woman comes to him, she committed adultery, she came up to him and she said, I'm sorry, I want to repent of my sin. He said, go and have your baby. This is showing he's merciful. She comes back with her baby. Take the child, we can use him, for, sell him for a slave, kill the woman. And of course, that's what he did. But he was merciful because he didn't kill her right there at the, on the spot when she, before she had her baby. 
the Ottoman Empire was defeated for a time, and now they're coming back. Islamic teaching is coming back, probably because of the oil, the money from the oil in Saudi Arabia. They had become somewhat secular, like Turkey had, but now Egypt and Iran have been behind much of the massacres in Bosnia, Serbia, Yugoslavia, the Christian genocide in Rwanda and various places in southern Sudan, the Armenian genocide of 1.5 million. Uh, they're not interested in presenting Christianity as Christians know. In other words, when they teach their people Christianity, it's not Christianity. It's a very perverted Christianity, and that's why my friend, Mark Gabriel, who um, from Egypt, he never really knew Christianity. In fact, not a single Christian tried to present Christianity to him during his whole life. They were afraid to, except his pharmacist. He was having stomach pains, and she slid a New Testament over to him. He read it all night, and he said, I don't need your, I don't need your medicine anymore. And he became a Christian. His father tried to kill him. He escaped to South Africa. But uh, anyway, as a result, they persecuted her. They tried to burn down her pharmacy. She's now in Canada. So the caliphs, like Abu Bakr, he was the first caliph in Medina, father of Aisha, that was Muhammad's wife, who he married when she was six or seven, he consummated the marriage when she was nine. He was 53 in Medina. But they say Islam has no borders, no countries, no law, Sharia. Only Sharia is, a, is valid, and it's a valid for every aspect of life. Ibn Ishaq wrote an excellent biography of Muhammad about 200 years after Muhammad lived. We don't have that today, but we have one by Ibn Hisham, and it's pretty accurate. Um, and he goes through some of the details, and I'm just going to just barely get started here, so I probably won't be able to get to the part I wanted to, but... Um, Anyway, the spread of Islam started in Saudi Arabia is going throughout the world. And some of the things that are doing by the Islamic Caliphate, the Caliphates, there was more than one. They would pretty much be the Caliphate. Uh, Abu Bakr was the first, but there were some in Egypt, various places, and they actually were at war with each other sometimes. And some of the things that they would do would be splitting a person in half by pulling two, uh, putting them by two camels going opposite directions, throwing people in wells, forcing people to eat themselves as they bake them, you know, just horrible things, and things that you shouldn't even be talking about, but that's the kind of thing that's happening, and it's happening today. So this is just a history of what uh, people are still doing this, and one caller said, that doesn't sound like a good hadith. So they beat him almost to death. Wait till he got well, then beat him again, then he got well, then he beat him again. Why don't you just kill me? One person they talked about stuffing ants down a person's mouth till they filled his stomach and killed him. You know, just horrible things that are happening. But you don't see that here. You'll see that where they have the Sharia law. Thank you. Dr. Lehman, would now be a good time to announce the lunch specials? <laughs> I want to thank uh, Pastor Brian Broderson for allowing uh, the opportunity to use their chapel today. have the privilege of living across the street from Brian and Cheryl Broderson, so we pray for each other and our kids, and it's great. Um, also, <clears throat> I think there was one other announcement. Uh, this is not the 37th district, which I represent, but you can see it right across the street. <laughs> uh, so you can see my district from here uh, once you cross the Costa Mesa border. Uh, it is my honor now to introduce Steve Jackson, who is a constitutional expert and lecturer, and he's going to provide an overview of the nation's Christian heritage and government, and I've heard Steve before, and uh, you're going to enjoy his scholarly work. Please welcome Steve Jackson. Props in place here.
getting a feed on the video here. Oh, it up here. It worked fine and during rehearsal. You know how that stuff goes. Okay. I know I was on, but I wasn't getting the right display on my end. I'd like to introduce the next speaker now. <laughs> okay. Now we're good to go. Thank you for your patience. I'm asked to speak on America's Christian Foundation. The title connotes biblical design elements from our country's past, and we'll be sharing a 15-minute sampling of that, including how faith and freedom relate. But I'll also be showing some images of recent events to illustrate the relevance of that foundation. Let me begin where David left off. In the aftermath of the 9-11 tragedy, talking heads on the news spun their lessons learned. The National Education Association urged teachers to use the event to teach that America must be more tolerant and warned teachers not to suggest that any particular group was responsible. Thank God for good Christian teachers soldiering on in government schools, but they're fighting a losing battle against a top-down system paralyzed by political correctness where tolerance of wrong trumps all virtues. And we are all told, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. If we learn anything from September 11, 2001, it should be this. It matters a lot what people believe. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The Islamic terrorists of 9-11 were sincere. Sincere people act on their beliefs. Providentially for us, America's founders believed in the God of the Bible. Most were Orthodox Christians who attended mainline Christian churches of diverse denominations. They all shared a biblical worldview. John Adams, the general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the only principles in which that beautiful assembly of young gentlemen could unite, the general principles of Christianity. And to be fair to our Jewish friends, it is proper to refer to our religious foundation as Judeo-Christian because many pieces of our foundation came from the Old Testament, B.C. In the war year of 1943, past President Hoover issued a joint statement that applies as America faces multiple threats today. He said, Menaced by collectivist trends, we must seek revival of our strength in the spiritual foundations which are the bedrock of our republic, the outgrowth of the religious convictions of the sacredness of every human life. America's founding fathers were smarter than I am, so I like to let them speak for themselves a tiny sample of statements of Christian faith from just three of the more famous founders. George Washington wrote of Jesus Christ as the divine author of our blessed religion. John Adams, the Christian religion is, above all, the religion of wisdom, virtue, equity, and humanity. In other words, practical for civil order. Alexander Hamilton, as he lay dying after his duel with Aaron Burr, I have a tender reliance on the mercy of the Almighty through the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am a sinner. I look to him for mercy. Pray for me. In my professional career as a structural engineer in manned space, I was privileged to play a small part in some magnificent structures. But none was better designed than the U.S. Constitution, built on the foundation of principles in the Declaration of Independence. I submit that America's founders were good engineers. They acted on their beliefs, and we are the lucky recipients of the fruit of their good designs. In a word, freedom. At the foundation is the Declaration of Independence, 
proclaiming the American view of law and government. There is a God, the God of the Bible. God is the source of law and rights. And the purpose of government is to secure our God-given rights. Forming the superstructure is the miraculous U.S. Constitution. It granted to the new government the powers it needed to be strong among the powers of the earth. It organizes those powers to effect our safety and happiness, and it limits those powers to a few and defined set necessary to protect life, liberty, and property within the narrow jurisdiction of the general government. Why limits? Lord Acton nailed it. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Because rulers have the same sin nature as those they govern, Thomas Jefferson reminds us, in questions of power then, let no more be heard of confidence in man, but bind him down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution. What did the Constitution's engineers say about it? George Washington on the adoption of the Constitution. It will demonstrate as visibly the finger of providence as any possible event in the course of human affairs. James Madison described the framing of the Constitution as a task more difficult than can be well conceived. It is impossible to consider the degree of concord which ultimately prevailed as less than a miracle. From where did our founding engineers get their ideas for that miracle at Philadelphia? Besides political philosophers like Cicero, Montesquieu, Blackstone, John Locke, and Battelle, the main source for the founders' education was the bestseller, the Bible. And when the founders spoke and wrote, fully one-third of their quotes came from the Bible, more than any other source. Daniel Webster, to the free and universal reading of the Bible in that age, men were much indebted for right views of civil liberty. If our founding fathers were the engineers of our government structure, then their preachers were its architects. David Barton, sermons on the biblical principles of government laid the intellectual basis for American independence. Pastors were the best educated men in the community, partly because 106 of America's first 108 colleges were founded primarily to train Christian clergy. So everyone looked to those pastors for knowledge, wisdom, and political advice. It is impossible to overstate the role these architects played in the design of our foundation. He looks a little bit like Pastor Chuck, doesn't he? <laughs> Noah Webster, the learned clergy, had great influence in founding the first genuine Republican governments ever formed. The people of this country are indebted chiefly to their institutions for the rights and privileges which are enjoyed. Roger Williams was a Baptist minister who coined the phrase that Jefferson used to describe the biblical separation meant to protect church from state. Williams said, Enforced uniformity confounds civil and religious liberty and denies the principles of Christianity and civility. Reverend Thomas Hooker preached a sermon to the Connecticut General Court on May 31, 1638 that influenced the fundamental orders of Connecticut, which in turn influenced the U.S. Constitution. In it, Hooker explained the three biblical principles that had guided the plan of government in Connecticut. The choice of public magistrates belongs unto the people by God's own allowance. The privilege of election belongs to the people, and it is in their power also to set the bounds and limitations of the power and place. Colonial pastors preached election day sermons and political sermons. This example comes from Pastor Samuel West in 1776. Tyranny and arbitrary power are utterly inconsistent with and subversive of the very end and design of civil government and directly contrary to natural law, which is the true foundation of civil government. Consequently, the authority of a tyrant is of itself null and void. The first national motto proposed for America in 1776 was rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God, a, submission, a sum, summation of the famous 1750 sermon preached by Reverend Dr. Jonathan Mayhew, a principal figure in the Great Awakening. The scriptural model for this position was repeatedly validated when God himself raised up leaders such as Gideon, Ehud, Deborah, Jephthah, and Samson to throw off tyrannical governments. Leaders subsequently praised in Hebrews 11.32 for those defensive acts of faith. 
When the British imposed on Americans the 1765 Stamp Act, at the vanguard of the opposition to that act were the Reverends Charles Chauncey, Samuel Cooper, Jonathan Mayhew, and George Whitfield. British-born Whitfield even accompanied Benjamin Franklin to Parliament to protest the Stamp Act and to assert colonial rights. As early as 1687, the Reverend John Wise was already teaching that taxation without representation is tyranny, the consent of the governed is essential to free government, and that every man must be acknowledged equal to every man. But those pastors really practiced what they preached. When the nighttime alarm sounded in Lexington to warn of the oncoming British regulars, citizens gathered at the town green, and according to early historian Joel Headley, there they found their pastor, the Reverend Clark, who had arrived before them. The roll was called, and 150 answered to their names. The church, the pastor, and his congregation thus standing together in the dim light awaiting the redcoats. Even though the Minutemen are still honored in many texts, their leader, the Reverend Jonas Clark, is no longer mentioned, nor the fact that many of the Minutemen were deacons in his church, nor the Reverend John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg, who led 300 men from his church against the British as one of Washington's most trusted generals. Mighty men they were, of iron nerve and strong hand and unblanched cheek and heart of flame. The British coined a name for them, the Black Robed Regiment, dreading them for the influence they wielded and hating them for the courage they infused into the colonists. The British directed the cruelest retribution toward them and their churches, as depicted in Mel Gibson's movie, The Patriot. An honest assessment of American history commands gratitude to those architect preachers and to our engineer founders. Returning to the present for a moment, what did NASA learn from the Challenger tragedy of January 28, 1986? Hopefully, listen to the engineers. The engineering specs for the rubber seals and the solid rocket boosters set limits on the temperature for safe launch. The rules said it was too cold that day, but NASA didn't listen to the engineers. The laws of nature are rules that will not be broken without cost. It was the laws of nature and nature's God, or natural law, that Jefferson cited as the very basis for declaring independence. It was to secure the blessings of liberty that the Constitution's specifications were written to achieve a precise balance of liberty under law. That delicate balance is threatened today by any number of dangerous foreign ideologies like Islam and by domestic tyranny. Most of America's problems today are the result of not listening to the engineers of our Constitution. Most of America's problems today were solved by those engineers almost 220 years ago when they wrote the rules to bind down the government by the chains of the Constitution. Foolishly, we just stopped listening to the engineers and started listening to the siren song of socialism, godless socialism, masquerading behind enticing names. These recent stories represent a small sampling of how the federal government has insinuated itself into our businesses, our churches, our police, and our most intimate personal affairs. Unconstitutional acts are legion. And time doesn't allow me any detail, but most involve violation of the Constitution's most basic doctrine, that of enumerated powers, whereby most powers are reserved to the states or to the people as the Tenth Amendment requires. The feds usurp powers not granted in Article I, Section 8, and deny rights protected by the Bill of Rights, always on some pretext like saving the planet, or general welfare, or interstate commerce, or safety. Speaking of safety, Benjamin Franklin said, they who can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Galatians 5.1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Freedom is not so much the right to choose. It is the result of making right choices. This is a message of love, not hate. The founders thought and acted biblically. Listen to the engineers tell us about the inseparable relationship between faith and freedom. Without the foundation of Christianity, there can be no virtue, and without virtue, there can be no liberty. The Christian religion in its purity is the basis and source of all genuine freedom in government. 
No human society has ever been able to maintain order and freedom apart from the moral precepts of the Christian religion applied and accepted by all the classes. The Americans combine the notions of Christianity and liberty so intimately in their minds that it is impossible for make, to make them conceive the one without the other. Our Constitution was made only for immoral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. Those who will not be governed by God will be ruled by tyrants. James Madison referred to the details of the Constitution when he said, every word of it decides a question between power and liberty. The details go even deeper. Because it was common practice in the founding era, the Constitution's authors capitalized the first letter of words to add emphasis. The familiar words to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity appear in the preamble. Why do you think ourselves has a, ca a small o while posterity has a capital P. Where is the emphasis? Posterity is like a relay race. Each generation runs its leg and must hand off the baton to the next. The baton is a humble thing. It's past a simple but monumental act. Do you remember the 2008 Summer Olympic Games in Beijing? The U.S. sent a dream team of track stars. Both our men's and women's relay teams were stacked with the fastest runners, individual gold medalists who each had plenty of relay experience. Experts said our men's and women's relay teams were assured of Olympic gold. They were so confident that because of their crowded event schedules, they didn't bother practicing the simple baton passes they had all done hundreds of times before. I remember. Neither our men's nor women's 4x100 relay teams got to run for their gold. Both those men's and women's teams disqualified themselves in preliminary heat because they failed to execute that simple baton pass. Their dream ended. It didn't matter how fast or strong they were. It doesn't matter how strong and free we are. If we and the next generation did not execute passing the baton of faith and freedom, the American dream ends. At age 70, Daniel Webster said, if we and our posterity shall be true to the Christian religion, we may have the highest hopes of the future fortunes of our country. But if we and our posterity reject religious instruction and authority, violate the rules of eternal justice, rifle with the injunctions of morality, and recklessly destroy the political constitution, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us. That shall bury all of our glory in profound obscurity. It matters what we believe. Thomas Jefferson said, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never was and never will be. Government schools aren't teaching faith and freedom. They're dumbing down our students, teaching them atheism and slavish dependency on big government. Where will our children learn about faith and freedom? The logical place is the place our founders learned it, the church. I call on the church to teach faith and freedom. Civil government is one of the three human institutions ordained by God. Church leaders throughout history have addressed issues of civil government. Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, Rutherford, and our own Puritan forebears. They taught that God limits civil government to its biblical jurisdiction. Dr. John Eidsmo says, the refusal of today's Christians to address issues of law and government is a modern heresy. Much of the Bible addresses law and government. If we ignore what the Bible says about those topics, we are not preaching the whole counsel of God. Call on the pastors of America to step up and introduce your congregations to the biblical worldview of the founders. Why not another great awakening? Jeremiah 6.16, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. The Bible, the Declaration, and the Constitution are good ways. I call on the pastors of America to be the architects of another American revolution, a peaceful one. In the, in the tradition of colonial architect preachers, teach your flocks to think and walk biblically and constitutionally, like our engineer founders. There are great organizations with faith and freedom resources to assist you. Some that I use are listed on the outline of this talk available at my table outside. Well Builders invites pastors to actually join the new Black Road Regiment. I call on the church to help pass the baton of faith and freedom. Thank you, and may God bless you.
Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm going to pass the baton to Mary, who will pick up the education team and run with it. Thank you, Steve. I started my career as a certified public accountant and a certified financial planner. And that's for Mary. That's for Mary. Thank you. Mary, Josh, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I was a partner in a CPA firm before I uh, went on to <clears throat> run for treasurer just for fun and got appointed to that position. But uh, my firm went on to merge with another firm by the name of Ronald Blue and Company, and their CEO, uh, Russ Crossan, uh, wrote a book which I read, uh, finished it yesterday. What makes a leader great? The discover the one key that makes the difference. And I had the privilege of meeting him last night, listened to him speak last night at a function, and, and he said, you know, we work so hard at helping people to manage their wealth and then to transfer it to their kids. But transferring money is not always the best thing to transfer to your kids. What you really need to transfer is your wisdom and how we really need to invest in our next generation and bring it forward. And that's why Steve's message is so important, how our founding fathers left something, a legacy, a real legacy, to make us wiser and better. So uh, with that little uh, interlude, I didn't know you'd be on the stage so fast, Mary. Very good. Um, <clears throat> Mary, you, uh, you are the co-founding member of the Missouri Coalition Against Common Core. So you flew here from Missouri. What city do you live in? Springfield. Springfield, the holy, the holy city. In the Bible. Belt. Got it. Okay. And uh, you have your master's in education in, in instructional design, and a doctorate in special education from Teachers College, Columbia University. It's very impressive. Uh, you've spent the last 20, 35 years in education. Uh, your first 10 years as a special educator, teaching all grade levels from parent infant programs all the way through K-12. So you're going to provide us with a breadth and the depth of knowledge on education and what's happening with Common Core and the rest. And we are really excited that you were able to fly here from Missouri to join us and looking forward to your comments. Thank you very much. Um, my doctorate is from Teachers College at Columbia University, and I only mention that because uh, here in California you, ha you have the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium with Linda Darling Hammond at the helm. Linda Darling Hammond and I were at Teachers College at the same time, uh, and so was Bill Ayers, but I am their nemesis. It's important uh, to be coordinated, so I did that. So I'm, I'm going to talk about three themes, and you'll find it in your brochures as well. Uh, the organizers of the conference wanted us to give you three takeaways, the way it was, how it changed, and the way it is, and how to fix it. So I've organized the PowerPoint in uh, those three themes, and I want to begin at the beginning, which is what Genesis means. So we'll start with the way it was, the story begins at the Genesis. And the reason I bring this up is because one of the fundamental uh, books of literature that our founders did learn from, not just in the churches, but in the schools, was the Bible. It was a textbook. And when I speak with my Jewish friend from Israel, he tells me that that is how they teach history in Israel, because that is their history, the Old Testament. And... Um, so the fact that that is being suppressed, even as a classic piece of literature, is an abomination, not just to people of faith, but to people of intelligence. Because you can't understand the illusions in American novels and literature uh, unless you know the parts of the Bible they come from. You can't understand Shakespeare unless you understand that he is actually using quotes when he says, um, neither borrower nor lender be. He's quoting from the Proverbs. 
Okay? And so these are magnificent statements of wisdom about how to live in the plays of Shakespeare, but he actually took them from the scriptures. If we rob our children of that heritage, of that classic piece of literature, we are dumbing down. And so it's not teaching religion to be teaching the Bible. It is also teaching religion. So I, I show you these parts of scripture as uh, parts of good literature so that you understand the stories of the scripture and what the stories were meant to tell you about the human heart. That's what great literature does. It gives you wisdom and values and morals, whether or not you believe them as a Christian or as a Jewish person, because um, it, it is just wisdom. And, and our founders knew that, so I, I want to get on to this. Um, Unfortunately, I did not get to see the text of the, in the slides prior to coming here. So I understand that it might not be as um, visible as possible. So I'm going to read to you the text I've picked out to show you the contrast. What's going on in American schools is a conflict between Judeo-Christian faith that they learn at home and in schools if they are um, coming out of the heritage of, of American history in conflict with humanism which is being taught. Humanism, if you go to the UNESCO website, humanism is the goal of education through UNESCO because they believe that's what's going to bring world peace. You will no longer have conflicts of, of religious values if everybody believes the same thing. So the question is, what did God say about humanism? Because it's in there, if you know how to read it. And it begins at the beginning. It begins in Genesis. And this is where it starts. If you look at Genesis versus the Greek philosophers, now mind you that the Old Testament is written at about 1000 BC. And then Plato's Republic is written at about 400 BC. So you see God's wisdom was first expressed in, in that great literature, the Old Testament. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So they're distinct but equal in the image of God. And he told them to settle the land. Okay, do you see how this is juxtaposed to humanism where you have no business being here, your footprint needs to be as small as possible, and you're equivalent to animals. All right? So this is my favorite line. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And now if you go back into Genesis and you look at what he does each day, he says God looked at it and saw it was good. But after he created man, he said, it is very good because it's in my image. All right? Then the serpent comes. Now God had planted liberty available for people to choose right from the Garden of Eden. This is in the story. The tree of liberty is that tree from which the apple I mean, that's the way the artist depicted it. It doesn't really say apple in the scripture, so don't hold me to that. But the whole point is, the tree is there because you have a choice. That's liberty. You always have a choice. It doesn't mean freedom from conflict. Liberty means conflict, and you must choose sides. Okay? And what God said, don't choose death. Choose life. But what the serpent said was you will not... Uh, you will not die. You will be like God. So God is trying to keep something from you here, okay? I'm going to tell you the truth. You will be like God. Now, do you see that's the first deception? So that when we get all bent out of shape because uh, unscrupulous and unethical people use fear and sneer to silence us, they are only following their father of lies which said, it set up the whole deception game in the book of Genesis. But you have to know the Bible and you have to know Genesis to understand you will not get rid of this with a bill. You will not get rid of this by a change in, in the um, elections in your government. You are dealing, you are immersed in the human story which began in the book of Genesis. All right? That means you are, just like this baton passer says, you are part of the link but that story started a long time ago. Whether or not you pass the truth on to the next generation really depends on you. But you have a choice. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from the land which he had been taken. And, he, and um, to work the ground from the land which he had been taken. 
So what, what God is getting at is learn that you're the created, not the creator. Put yourself in right relationship with God. All right? He's the one who's all powerful. You are the created. It was his pleasure to make you for friendship. But you're, make no mistake, you're not equal. <laughs> and you don't make a very good God. All right? Now, know that the Greek philosophers then knew uh, about all of these ideas that were percolating that would actually elevate man to the status of a god. But to do that, you had to explain how man got there in the first place. So we have Alexander... <laughs> An Anaximander, who introduced the theory of spontaneous generation. Diogenes, who introduced the concept of primordial slime. Empedocles, who introduced the theory of survival of the fittest in natural selection. Democrates advocated the mutual, mutual ability and adaptation of species. And Lucretius announced that all life sprang from Mother Earth. Does that sound familiar? Do you understand Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun? All right, and that Darwin didn't have an original idea in his head. All right, so here's the point. When you contrast the stories in Genesis with the philosophies of the Greek, you either believe in the creator or you're a slime-swimming elitist. All right, now slime-swimming elitists believe that in the evolution, there will be people at different stages of development, and the people at the highest stage should be running your government. you get that? You are lower in their strata of classification, and therefore you need to be taken care of. Does it sound familiar? This is humanism, folks. This is humanism. And it was, it was told to you right there in the book of Genesis that you would be engaged in this struggle. So it continues when Cain builds the city of Enoch. Enoch. There are several Enochs in the Bible. This was the first one. When Cain killed his brother, God wanted to make sure that he understood he had done wrong. And he said, you know, you're going to wander the rest of your life. And Cain said, I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain, and so that no one finding him would slay him. Then Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Do you know who wrote that book? East of Eden. An American novelist, John Steinbeck. Do you understand the title unless you understand Genesis? All right? East of Eden is a land of restlessness where you will never find peace. And, and Cain said to God, you know, God offered him um, a protection that said, okay, I'm going to punish you, but I will also protect you. And Cain said, well, thanks for that, but no thanks. I will be my own God. I will build a city of man. And that's why when you hear... Um, uh, black robe regimen pastor whose name escapes me right now uh, no it wasn't it was the, the person who arrived with the Puritans um, but he described the city on the hill that actually came from the book of Genesis when Abraham was looking outside of his tents to see the goal that God had in mind which is the city of God so Genesis constantly sets up this dichotomy between living in the city of God and living in the city of man. Cain sets up the city of man, and he's going to name the city after his son Enoch. Do you see, that's how he becomes eternal. Okay? So Psalm 49 says, For he sees that even wise men die, the stupid and the senseless alike perish, and leave their wealth to others. Their inner thought is that their houses are forever, and their dwelling places to all generations. They have called their lands after their own names, but man in his pomp will not endure. See, God's got your number. Okay, so humanists, you know, you can exercise futility or you can make it right with your creator, get in right relationship. That's what this story is about. So my favorite story here regarding Common Core then is the Tower of Babel because it talks of standardization. Man in his hubris of bringing these cities of men together and building them, 
needs standardization in his system. And he says, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly and use brick for stone. God made natural stone in different shapes and sizes, like individual people. But man can't tolerate that. He needs precision, and he's going to standardize by building bricks. Got it? All right. And they use tar for mortar. So the person uh, writing the, the story knows exactly what it means to use appropriate building material. Mortar is stable, will hold things in place. Tar in the heat is going to slide, and your building is going to do what? It's going to destabilize. Um, so they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city. At that time, a city is a city-state. All right? So it's a form of centralized government where God's people were out meeting him in the wilderness, meeting him in the wilderness, man was insulating himself with his own contraptions. Got it? We're not different. We're not different than the characters in the stories of Genesis. And that is my point. Don't think that we are abandoned by God. God sent us a Savior after these stories were written to redeem the world. He doesn't save his son and have him die in the manner he died and then walk away from us. We walked away from him. So we have to get back in right relationship for God to heal us. Okay, and that's going to come uh, a little bit later. But I want you to understand these stories as literature uh, so that you understand the uh, parallels and the symbolism going on here. So the, the tower whose top will reach heaven, do you understand? You want to become a god, is utopia. Let us make for ourselves a name. That's how you have all these uh, billionaires in the news controlling your government, right? They're using their money uh, that way. Um, I've got one minute left, I'm told. I was originally told I had 45, so um, I do have 45. Okay, she's going to run this 15-minute thing three times then. You got it? All right. <laughs> so Israel rejects the rule of God. Israel is no different than Cain. This is when Samuel the prophet is uh, just grieving because he's going to be the last prophet. This is with the king, who, and, and he goes to God and he says, they're rejecting you, and, he, and or, they're rejecting me, and God says, no, they're rejecting me. But before I give them a king, let me tell you what the kings will do and warn them first, because he always does that. He always gives us a choice. Here's what they will do. The king will reign over you, will claim his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of the chariots, in other words, draft for the military. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, centralized government. You get it? That's what, that's what they're now calling progressive federalism. They're actually turning your state capitals into nodes of power from Washington, D.C., rather than maintaining the, the structure of the Republic of Republics, separate governments under a larger protected government. Okay. So, and to others who will plow the ground and reap his, his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots, he will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olives and give them to his attendants. That's cronyism. He will take a tenth of your grain vintage and give them to his officials and attendants. He'll use your taxes to pay off his supporters, right? Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys, he will take for his own use live a lavish lifestyle. He will take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become his slaves. He'll take your personal wealth. He'll redistribute your wealth and freedom. Here's what Proverbs has to say then. The government is not responsible for your children's education. The parents are. That's what local control was all about. And it says so in the scriptures, and the Puritans knew it. In Proverbs 1.8, it says, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake, forsake your mother's teaching. But we have a generation raised up thinking they go to work while the government educates the children. All right? So um, 
listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning so you do not forsake my teaching. Give wisdom and get understanding. This is not workforce development. Okay? You were to get a liberal arts education so that you understood morality and virtue and leadership. Liberal arts gives you that. All right? You were to get the wisdom of the Proverbs and the Psalms so that you understood what it said about government, even in the book of Exodus. The Hebrew Republic is described in Exodus 20. And, and that was a model used for the formation of our republic. But you won't find that in the social studies books. Proverbs 22.6 then, Parents, train up your child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So, if you yourself wasn't the teacher, at least you should have control of your local school district through your school boards. But in centralized government, what they are doing is usurping that local control, moving it up to the state level, and even removing state decision making so that it is centralized from Washington, D.C. That's what the copyright and the Common Core State Standards is about. It is a private product used for public policy. And that means it is totally out of your hands. That is the quintessential hallmark of this centralized system, the copyright. I do not go into the weeds, although I can. Trust me, there's enough wrong with the content of the Common Core Standards. We could debate that all day. But the, the key that you have to know is it is not just a transformation of content, it's a transformation of your government system because of the copyright. Now they say they're protecting the copyright writers, but what it does is it is linked to the assessments. So you got the in, input from the standards and your output there on your test scores. These tests are linked to the standards via the SBAC agreement with your state. That means it's a closed system, and, and your school districts will be determined whether they are credited or not on the test scores from these tests. So they've got the whole thing figured out. It's in different pieces, but if you know where to look, it's there. And trust me, they are taking away local control so that parents no longer have input, or they want you there to help educate according to their agenda. But that's what this is about. This is from Plato's Republic. Plato set up academies, and, and I want you to appreciate this because it's got the descriptors of Common Core in it. In both the Republic and the Laws, Plato identifies education as one of the most important aspects of a healthy state. Now this isn't for wisdom and understanding of the individuals and knowledge of God. This is for the state's economy. All right. He lays out detailed education programs that start with exercises for pregnant women that they should perform to ensure the health of the unborn child. There is a YouTube post of a, a Superintendent Saxon from Oregon saying P in T and P20 means prenatal because they want to know that the mother is taking care of the unborn child for the good of the state. Okay? Goes on to explain not only that children should study, but what values the children should study. I guarantee there were no pastors on the Common Core content development team. Okay? One can achieve only one uh, so much by arguing with the corrupt soul with a virtuous life is better. Instead, Plato recognizes the need to teach children from an, a young age. He actually says this. Plato thinks that ch children's education is the last thing that should be left to chance or parental whim. What he's after is standardization, just the way uh, the Tower of Babel was after standardization. Then what they will do is have an observation laboratory in these academies where children are challenged with certain activities. You will have observers determine which children um, show propensity for the values valued by the state. All right, and then they will be selected to go into government. That is exactly what the guardians of Plato's Republic are, are selected to do. Now, what you should appreciate is that Plato's Republic uh, was the first political document explaining uh, a utopian government. He had these academies to teach his um, philosophy and his ways. They died out, they were closed, but then there was a resurrection. That's what the Renaissance is. It's a resurrection of the classical studies. Plato's academies were resurrected in the 1400s, and 
inconsistent with that were the, several, the seven liberal arts. The seven liberal arts were liberty arts. And what they included was grammar, rhetoric, logic, and um, a study of history. Okay? So the liberal arts were reserved for those people who would be in the government class. They were the aristocracy. Then you had the servile arts, and they would be the craftsmen, the workers. Um, in other words, the people who served under the uh, aristocracy. But what you had in this class system then was an understanding that was actually precipitated by John Wycliffe's writing of the Bible in English. All right, he's the morning star. He's the one that translated the Bible from Latin into English. And of course, the Pope didn't want him to do that because there's all kinds of stuff about people being, you know, equal in the priesthood under God, and it was just going to get messy, so don't do it, John. Um, but he did it anyway. And when that happened, handwritten Bibles were circulated through the grassroots. That's exactly what's going on now. Information was circulated through the grassroots, and it was causing controversy. Eventually what happened, when you had a bad king, you had um, nobles who were wanting to limit the bad king's influence on the government, and that gave birth to the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta then was limiting the king's power, but the Mayflower Compact and, and mind you, the Puritans were seditionists, okay? The king did not want them reading the Bible because, again, there was all kinds of things about liberty and republics, and, and there certainly was not a handing down of the crown through the bloodline, not at all. And the king didn't want the people to know that. So uh, the Puritans then were actually breaking the law to read the Bible in secret. They go to Leiden, Holland, right? And who do they meet there? But the Jews from the, from, that were um, expelled from Spain. And that's where they came in contact with the Mishnah Torah. And that's where they learned Exodus is not just a book of faith, it's a political document that describes the government. And so the Puritans couldn't go back to be living under a king. Andrew and I were talking last night. I'm Mary Margaret. My mother is from the O'Connell clan. All right? And um, my family came over here in the 1700s. We were part of the Irish diaspora. <laughs> that's, that's how we look at it. Um, we, we are from a tribal background. My O'Connell clan is still very much alive, and we celebrate each other because we know what it is to be part of family. And the Puritans, when they came over, came in their families. And what they saw was American Indians living in tribes. They knew this could work. It could work. So when they set up the Mayflower Compact, there was no king. What they, what they engaged in, and this is what makes it precious, they engaged in a social compact with each other to be mutually supportive in their organization of civil government to protect their rights and liberties. It was the Mayflower Compact that was the single most inspiration for our Declaration of Independence and Constitution. The Mayflower Compact was eliminated from the AP history framework released last year under the, the supervision of David Coleman. And I don't care how he tries to escape his responsibility in that. The buck stops with him.